Hi everyone, it's me again, Sean. I'm going to give a taster lecture on one of my favourite topics on bacteriophage. So the taster lecture really is just to give you an idea of what a level 4 lecture is like. This will be a, a slightly condensed version of uh, a full-length lecture that I would normally give. Um, this is just to give you a flavour of what to expect. We often start our taster lectures with learning objectives. Uh, this slide is int intended to guide students in terms of their learning and what to focus on when they uh, study for assessments. So the learning objectives for this lecture on bacteriophage is firstly to know what is a bacteriophage, to know the different life cycles of phages, as we call them for short, appreciate the importance of phages, particularly in bacterial evolution, and to know the potential of phages in terms of its application to research in medicine. So, what is a bacteriophage or bacteriophage? It is a virus that infects only bacteria. Some of you may have heard of this, but probably to most people this is completely new. Most of us think of viruses as only infecting mammalian cells. But that's not true. There are viruses that infect only bacteria and they are called bacteriophages or phages for short. They were discovered in 1915 and 1917 independently by two scientists, Twart and Darrell. They are estimated to be in the region of 10 to the power of 31 particles, and this makes phages the most abundant group of microorganisms on Earth. Phages can be broadly categorized into virulent or temperate phages. And this categorization refers to the different lifestyles that they have after they've infected the bacterial host cell. Virulent phages will infect and kill bacterial cells immediately. And they do this through a lytic cycle. Temperate phages, on the other hand, will infect a bacterial host cell and thereafter it can stay dormant until it is triggered to kill the host cell. It achieves being dormant through what we call a lysogenic cycle. And then when it is triggered, it will then kill the bacterial host cell through a lytic cycle. On the right side of the slide is a transmission electron micrograph of a bacteriophage particle. You will see that it has a head that is normally icosahedral. It doesn't look very icosahedral in this electron micrograph, I admit, but trust me, they are usually icosahedral. And that's followed by a sheath that sometimes is contracted along a tail. So in this electron micrograph, we see the sheath as being contracted and beneath the sheath is a tail that's extending out. We can detect the presence of phages by doing a Plaque assay. This assay is quite simple to do in the lab. So in this slide, I presented three plates. On the first plate on the left, that says no phage control, this essentially consists of a petri dish with bacteria growing as a lawn all across it. The bacterial lawn looks cloudy and it looks a little bit creamy in this slide. In the middle panel is the bacterial lawn with some phages added and you will see small little dots of clearing. These little dots of clearing are plaques and they are formed by successive rounds of bacterial lysis after a phage particle has infected a bacterial cell. So this bacterial cell will lyse and in the process more phage virions will burst out of the, of the bacterial cell. These phage virions will then go on and infect more bacterial cells, which will go through the same lytic process. So 
with every round of lysis, more and more bacterial cells will be killed. And these successive rounds of lysis results in an area of clearing that is large enough for us to see without a microscope. Now, on the right-hand side panel is a Petri dish with bacteria as well as a lot more phage added to it. And the end result of that is the formation of so many plaques that they are starting to, to come together. And the effect of that is an almost completely lysed bacterial lawn so that you can almost see entirely through the bacterial lawn that is clear. Now, I've talked a lot about lysis and a little bit about the lysogenic cycle. In this slide, this diagram here very nicely illustrates what is a lytic and what is a lysogenic cycle. Now, starting at the top, we see an infectious phage particle. It will then absorb to a phage receptor on the bacterial cell wall. This phage receptor tends to be a feature that is found on the bacterial cell wall. After absorption, the phage will then inject its DNA into the bacterial cell. If this phage was a virulent phage, then what happens is that the phage DNA will cause the bacterial cell host DNA to degrade and instead to produce more of phage DNA and proteins needed to make phage particles. This then results in the phage DNA being packaged into virus particles and these phage particles being released. As a result of this release, the bacterial cell is killed and that's known as lysis. But if this infectious phage particle was a temperate phage, then after adsorption, and after injection of the phage DNA, this phage DNA could integrate into the bacterial genome. When that happens, the phage DNA is known as prophage, and it can be stably maintained within the bacterial chromosome and passed on to daughter bacterial cells for many generations. However, the stability or dormancy of the prophage can at some point be broken when there is a trigger. Often this trigger is a stress-related trigger to the bacterial cell. So we call this process phage induction. This means that the prophage is induced into going into a lytic cycle. The phage DNA is normally excised after induction, and then many phage genes are then expressed. Phage genomes are being replicated, and that follows through in the lytic cycle for new phage variants to be produced and released, and for the bacterial cell to lyse. Now, at the bottom of this slide are a few scientific terms that one often uses in phage biology. These are adsorption, known as the process where phage binds to bacterial cell wall receptors, prophage, which is the term used to describe a phage genome that is stably maintained within a bacterial cell, or phage genome integrated into the bacterial host genome. Lysogen, which is the term used to describe a bacterial cell carrying a prophage. And phage induction, which is the process of triggering a prophage into a lytic cycle to produce progeny. Now 
Now let's move on to the importance of phages. Phages are extremely important when it comes to evolution of bacteria. And this is important to us because there are many pathogenic bacteria that cause disease in humans. Interestingly, many of these pathogenic bacteria are pathogenic because of phages. So phage can affect the virulence of bacteria and they can also affect the antibiotic resistance of bacteria. And as we all know, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem of late and it means that bacterial infections become untreatable using antibiotics. And understanding the process of how that can happen can help us reduce antibiotic resistance. Now, phages can contribute to bacterial virulence through a process called lysogenic conversion, and it can contribute to antibiotic resistance through a process called transduction. And these are two things that we will focus on in this taste lecture today. But just so you know, phages are also important in conferring immunity to bacteria. So bacteria also have their own immune system, it's a very simple version compared to humans, but bacteria can be immune to phage infections. Phages are also important because we can make use of them. We can make use of them as antibacterial agents. And this is something that I will also talk about today in the Taster Lecture. Phage components can also be used as an antimicrobial but I won't be focusing so much uh, on this today. Now let's talk about virulence. Phages can carry toxins and transfer the ability to make toxins to whatever bacterial cell they infect. And this process is called lysogenic conversion. So we see in this diagram how that can happen. If we have an infectious phage particle, it infects a bacterial cell, but within the phage genome, there is a toxin gene encoded. So that means when the prophage integrates its genome into the bacterial genome, the prophage encoded toxin gene can be expressed and make the bacterial host produce toxins. There are many examples of bacterial cells or lysis. Next, we look at antibiotic resistance that are mediated by phage through a process called transduction. Now, this is different from lysogenic conversion in that the antibiotic resistance genes that are transferred are not carried by the phage genome. Instead, they are being packaged in the phage heads as a mistake. So you will remember that in the lytic cycle, phages will package their own genome into infectious phage virions, which then go on to infect new cells. When there is a mistake in packaging and these phages package antibiotic resistance genes that are present in the bacteria at the time rather than their own genomes, a transducing particle results. This transducing particle is able to infect another bacterial cell but in the process of this infection, it then confers antibiotic resistance to the cell it infects. This is illustrated in these two diagrams here. Transduction can be either generalized or specialized. The top panel shows generalized transduction and it shows here the 
fudge particle with the black squiggly lines in it as the transducing particle that doesn't contain any fudge DNA, but instead contains antibiotic resistance genes. So when this transducing particle goes to infect a bacterial cell, this piece of DNA that's been carried by the transducing particle integrates itself into the bacterial genome and is being expressed. And that makes the bacterial cell antibiotic resistant. In specialized transduction, it is slightly different in that the packaging process results due to an imprecise cutting of the phage genome that's being packaged so that the phage has packaged some phage genes as well as some antibiotic resistance genes that is very close to the phage genome. And this is indicated by the red and black squiggly lines that are in the phage virion. Now this specialized transducing particle can go on to infect a cell and again through phage prophage integration into the bacterial cell genome result in a transduced cell that expresses antibiotic resistance genes. In this table are examples of bacteria that become uh, resistant to particular antibiotics as a result of antibiotic resistance genes being acquired through phage transduction. So we have Staphylococcus aureus expressing beta lactamase because it has acquired the MECA resistance gene through phage transduction. Another example is Clostridium difficile which can express macrolide resistance as a result of acquiring the ERM-B antibiotic resistance gene. And there are also more examples for other bacterial species such as Enterococcus faecalis, Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas rugosa, and Klebsiella pneumoniae. And now let's talk about how we can apply phages to human health. The phrase, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, is quite a nice one to describe bacteriophage therapy. Because bacteriophages are natural predators of bacteria, especially virulent phages, they can be used to treat infections caused by multi-drug resistant bacteria that antibiotics are ineffective against. So phage therapy can be used as an alternative to antibiotics in such situations. There are two uh, examples that have been uh, reported in the news. The very first one is from the UK, uh, Joe Holdaway and her daughter, Isabel Holdaway, are featured in this news article. So Isabel Holdaway was close to dying after a lung transplant. She developed an infection by Mycobacterium abscessus. This particular bacterium was antibiotic resistant and the infection spread to the rest of her body and it produced nodules underneath the skin that you can see on the top left hand corner of this slide. So she was expected to die. Her mother was able to find scientists working on mycobacterium phages. These scientists found some phage that were sensitive, sorry, that were able to infect the particular strain that was causing an infection in Isabel. 
one can see the transmission electron micrographs of these phages on the top middle panel of the slide. These phages, however, were genetically modified. And this was to enable more effective treatment of their infection. The phages were given intravenously twice a day for six weeks. After this, Isabel recovered and was cured without any side effects. Here is another example of a patient who was cured by phages. This man, Thomas Patterson, was infected by Acinetobacter bomani. It is a multi-drug resistant bacterium. The infection was untreatable with antibiotics. And his wife contacted scientists working on phages active against a bomani. And they managed to find several phages that could kill the particular strain. Tom Patterson was eventually cured with intravenous phage along with an antibiotic that was synergistic within three months. And you can read more about this particular case in the link provided here. We've seen now two nice examples of how phage therapy can be applied, but there is still quite a long way to go before phage therapy is used regularly in the clinic. There are many advantages to phage therapy However, there are also many disadvantages to phage therapy that will be discussed in a workshop if you were to come to UH. Normally, sometime in my lectures, I would run a Mentimeter quiz just to, uh, as a fun way to test uh, whether students have understood the lecture. Unfortunately, I can't run a Mentimeter quiz on a recorded uh, taste lecture. Uh, but I've just put up a, an example of the question that I would ask, and I'd like you to think about it. See if you can answer this question. How is a temperate phage different from a virulent phage? Is it A, it is infective only at a certain temperature? B, it has a different shape? C, it has a different size? D, it can remain dormant in the host cell after infection? or E, it can kill the host cell after infection. Let's take a moment to think. So hopefully, most of you would have answered D. It can remain dormant in the host cell after infection. Temperate phages and virulent phages may be infective across a whole range of temperatures. They can vary in shape and size. Temperate phages and virulent phages are indistinguishable based on shape and size. And temperate phages, like virulent phages, can kill the host cell after infection. Usually, lectures will end with a slide on recommended reading. And this just lists the resources that uh, contain information and additional material relevant to what has been covered in the lecture. Okay, everyone, I hope that you've enjoyed this taste lecture. I hope that you found it interesting. And I hope that, at the very least, you might find the topic of bacteriophages exciting and perhaps go on and read more about it in your own time. Thanks very much for your attention. Bye for now.